right, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, Global Connections here on a given Thursday at 1 p.m. And we're asking the question today, uh, how AMLO, and AMLO stands for Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador, president of Mexico, how AMLO is doing after the U.S. election. So interesting. And for this discussion, we have our regular contributor, Carlos Suarez. Hi, Carlos. Nice to see your smiling face. Always a great pleasure to reconnect with you, Jay, of course, and, uh, you know, continue our dialogue as we do often uh, about this important neighbor to the South, Mexico, largest trading partner there after China, and, you know, a very important part, and yet often it's not on the radar for many Americans, or maybe it will be more now, because given the transition in the U.S. to the Biden administration, we might expect to see more engagement very soon with Mexico, uh, but there are a lot of things happening. Uh, most importantly, just in the last couple of days, we've had some uh, big news coming out. Uh, President Lopez Obrador of Mexico, in a tweet, has announced that he has been infected with the COVID-19. Uh, you know, another head of state uh, following you know several others that we've had in the past, uh, and so it presents a real interesting uh, puzzle challenge, uh, as you might imagine. Too, a lot of uh, you know even questioning whether it's real or is it somehow a political strategy just to you know. Uh, and, and it's difficult to say, and I've been consulting and, you know, many students I have in Mexico as well. I was, uh, I must say, I'm a little, um, not entirely surprised, but I was quite, uh, quite surprised to see the overwhelming uh, majority of what I would call reasonable people saying they have doubts about whether it's real. Uh, and I mm. think it speaks to a lot of the credibility crisis. The president, uh, President AMLO, has been one of the leaders of the world who has often minimized uh, and downplayed uh, the pandemic from the start uh, and taken a lot of criticism from it, uh, even jokes about how he has claimed that these religious amulets that he has are going to somehow protect him. Uh, he has been refusing to wear masks, uh, very much uh, similar to the other right-wing populists from Brazil, Bolsonaro, like Trump. Uh, Lopez Obrador comes from the left. He's a populist leader from the left, but in 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 following this sort of uh, this pattern of, of not taking it as seriously, uh, many have begun to question now uh, how real his, his announcement that he's infected really is. Uh, not only that, but as we speak now, like in many parts of the world, I mean, Mexico and in particular Mexico City is, is undergoing the most, uh, you know, highest level of, 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 uh, of pandemic uh, deaths. Uh, just this past week, they announced 1,800 deaths a day, uh, breaking the record of a single oh, day. Wow. This is quite substantial. Uh, and here again, uh, it underscores a lot of the uh, maybe frustration that people are finding mixed signals often from the government uh, and, and beginning to have doubts about trusting if they're getting good information. Um, and what we're also learning is that it's probably a much higher death toll than, than sure. what, we're, what we're seeing. And it's already among the highest in the world. So, um, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, how they get through this. Uh, but like often, you know, the president has faced now a, a credibility crisis. Let me add, though, that he, he does remain, you know, popular, I guess, among, uh, you know, in part because there's not a lot of alternatives. Uh, but he came to power uh, the election of uh, two years ago now and inaugurated just over two years ago, basically, um, you know, on a groundswell movement, a very, a very wide support, rejecting the previous, you know, administration and, and, and the political system. But like always happens, you know, after a year or two, the honeymoon is over. And now, of course, he's confronted with this pandemic, like all leaders, uh, which has frozen the economy. And, and, and you know, Mexico is, is suffering quite a bit, uh, a downturn in the economy, uh, a health crisis that continues to rage. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how this is going to play out in terms of the politics and, and, and the impact on, on this leader. You know, I, 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 you know, in our discussions and in my own observation of how he's been doing over the past uh, few years, um, two years anyway, uh, I have, I've not been impressed. I've not been impressed with his uh, way of dealing with Trump and the whole thing about the border and the wall and the demands Trump has made on him for, you know, troops at the wall and, and various concessions that Trump has demanded of him. And then I haven't been impressed with his, uh, you know, position on uh, well, in any of the major issues confronting that I know, confronting Mexico, and, and certainly uh, he seems to be a bit of a trumper, which is the, the worst insult I can imagine for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you, and, what, and you wonder, and I want to go back with you for a moment, you wonder how in the world he got elected 
uh, you know, what is it among the Mexican electorate that would have elected this man president in the 21st century? Well, again, it, it's a, the quick short answer is that it was very much a protest of the previous very corrupt and unpopular president, uh, you know, that was before him. Um, and this particular leader, AMLO, he had been, he had run two times before, uh, allegations of a lot of fraud in the first time where maybe the election was stolen from him, hard to know, but he, he obviously did not win twice. And he did win the third time. And by most measures, it was a very relatively fair election and he won it substantially. And while there was an appeal that he represented, you know, kind of like as a populist leader, an alternative, obviously critical of the previous, um, you know, he has governed also in that same way somewhat. Uh, he hasn't really expanded his base, let's say. He's been eroding some of it. But as a populist leader, he is obviously, uh, in a curious way, he, he does have a lot of elements of Trump or the other leader in Brazil, Bolsonaro. They are from the right. Uh, and yet, in a curious way, once you speak of this populist element, they kind of come full circle and they have some common elements. Uh, they have a disdain for experts, a disdain for the press. Uh, they alone have the solution, the sort of certain, you know, uh, uh, I guess, uh, whatever we would call that. Um, uh, and, you know, with AMLO, it's, it's again, a, a system of government that has, you know, decades and decades of, of corruption and, and, and a lot of uh, unpopularity. So when he came to power, it was with, a, you know, partly a rejection of the past, uh, uh, kind of a rejection of the dominant political parties uh, that had governed forever. Uh, and so in a curious way, he was elected more as an individual, not so much his party, which is really more of a, a new party that is really him, um, and certainly an appeal of populism because Mexico suffers from deep injustice, inequality, corruption, and so offering a solution that somehow, you know, we're going to just change all that. And, and yet you can't, you can't do it overnight. <coughs> the system today now, several years later, uh, perhaps there's growing frustration uh, because confronted with this pandemic, he has not done very well at handling it and, and has lost a lot of the trust. Uh, let me be clear, though, it's not as if he's completely you know, lost all his popularity, but it is eroding substantially. Uh, and in particular, we're seeing the handling of this crisis uh, and even now his infection uh, as opportunities for people to just criticize even more and to be concerned. <clears throat> he is, after all, uh, uh, and in fact, just an example of his populism, um, he gave up the presidential plane that had been bought by the predecessor and has tried to sell it, hasn't been able to. But effectively, as a head of state of a major country like Mexico, he travels by coach class on a commercial airline. Uh, and even last week, as he was just infected, here he was traveling on an airplane coach class. Uh, so many people are like, you know, that's, that's inappropriate behavior. Moreover, getting infected after so many months now, a whole year of not taking it so seriously, not wearing masks, so many people are, you know, sort of, you know, you, you, it's to be expected. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. He is a 67-year-old, but he's had uh, heart attacks already as a heart attack survivor. He's in a high-risk category. And, for example, his populism was saying, well, he's not going to get the vaccine because he wants to be like everyone else, no special privileges. He will wait his turn until the middle of March. Now, by uh, any more objective, rational reasoning, a head of state, should be a priority to keep alive, and he should be one of the first to get the missing. Yeah, no, not in yeah. this case. Yeah, I, I have this vision of him on the plane there, um, <laughs> having been found infected, shedding virus all, all over the plane. Uh, what, what a scene! But you know what's what's ironic about it is that you 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 know if in, in a situation, and, and if you if you know contrary, let me know. But in a situation like that, he had symptoms. He had symptoms. Then he went and got tested. It wasn't a random test. And so, you know, he's already down the track of COVID. And as you say, he's 67. He's got some comorbidities. Um, he may be a real, a real risk here. And, and you know, the fancy drugs that uh, Trump took, and I think Pence, who else, was one of, one of Trump's uh, cohorts there. Uh, oh yeah, uh, uh, Giuliani took the Regeneron uh, drug, which is a you know uh, after you get it kind of drug. Uh, um, mm -hmm. That's not going to be available to Amlo, and Trump can't help him with that. Trump is out of office, uh, so you know he he runs a real risk of getting very sick and dying. Mm -hmm. And it's, no, the, the irony is ten feet tall because 
he, he's the one who was ignoring the COVID all this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but along what you described, for example, with Trump, there was often criticism that while he gets, you know, whisked off to, you know, what is it, to the uh, military hospital, the best care in the world. Similarly, there, there's a lot of criticism that AMLO is going to have the luxury of actually, a, you know, quality care that most Mexicans will not. Uh, and as, especially, again, as we speak today, the, the, the situation in, in Mexico City, especially, is just at a very, very critical uh, crisis. And added to that, there has been a bit of a scandal or maybe ongoing crisis because of mixed signals, mixed information that the, the government has been issuing. Uh, and in particular, you know, they use a system in Mexico of, uh, I guess they're called like a traffic light sign, you know, red, orange, green, et cetera. And they have a criteria that it goes to this level when it reaches a certain, you know, certain metrics, certain indicators. As it's coming out now, some information that the government issued different data and it should have locked down Mexico City in early December. They chose not to for several weeks. And when they finally did, the situation is now obviously at a very, you know, worse. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and just different. So again, mixed signals that the government has sent has affected the credibility of that. Uh, and so the debates continue raging there. What's real, what's not. Add to that, that in, in general, Mexico has a, a strong disposition to a lot of conspiracy theories, and partly because there's just so much, uh, you know, crazy stuff, uh, hard to believe, hard to get good, accurate information. So it just fuels a lot more of that. This becomes a real crisis, as you imagine, um, when you're moving forward with a vaccination program, if people don't believe, don't trust the government, you have a legitimacy crisis, a credibility crisis. Uh, if you have less people participate, uh, and this is true everywhere, we're going to have the same problem in the U.S., uh, I've been seeing some reports, I guess, of some of the, you know, some places where you're seeing less participation in in the programs, right? Um, Then added to that, Mexico, just like every country, has now uh, suddenly gotten the reality that those doses of the the virus are not coming in the quantities they had ordered. They've had to desperately look for others. You have a visit this past week of one of the deputy foreign ministers of Russia. They're trying to negotiate with Russia getting one of their viruses, I'm sorry, vaccines. Uh, concerns that those are not as effective, don't have the rigorous, you know, uh, testing that's done uh, in the U.S. and Europe, let's say, um, and so a real challenge all along. But Mexico, again, right now, confronting like many places this crisis with a leader suddenly infected, with population beginning to doubt uh, government credibility. Uh, so it's it's a recipe for, I guess, some some tough times ahead. Uh, and like we hear again and again, it's likely to get worse in the near term before it gets any better. Um, and then finally, I would just add to this, and this is true of Mexico especially, but also a lot of other developing countries where a high percentage of the population work in the informal economy. That is, they don't have jobs that are normal with you know health benefits and the like. They don't have the luxury to stay home, moreover. So that um, even if the government tries to lock down, they simply can't control it in the same way that you might in you know, a, a different country with a smaller informal sector. Uh, add to that, the crisis has added more people into that informal economy as factories have closed, other you know businesses have closed. So it is a, a real challenge. Again, Mexico, not alone. This is true of a lot of developing countries where many people don't have the luxury to stay home and obviously protect themselves. So uh, it's a tough, tough What challenge. about the variant? You know, if you have a lot of cases in a given country, uh, the, the mutations increase. You, you can have homegrown variants, so certainly you can get imported variants. Uh, have there been reports of variants in, in uh, Mexico? I, I haven't seen much of that yet. I mean, we're hearing all that in just in the last days, of course, but uh, I think what, what is interesting, and, and another report I read just days ago, a very large number of American citizens who are choosing to head to Mexico uh, partly because of the more relaxed lockdown, partly the cost of living, but also, again, places like California, where right now the situation is so desperate, so that uh, I think it was a New York Times article describing essentially a wave of Americans that are coming uh, into Mexico. And that's a mixed blessing, too, because on one hand, you know, it, it, these are people that themselves could be carrying more. And, and so it's a, it's a trade off. Um, and I have some figures that are quite dramatic uh, in terms of the number of Americans. Let me just mention a few, for example. We've seen now in the last few months a very large number of Americans who are going to Mexico, uh, as many as, uh, I have some data here from a recent report, as many as 50,000 arrived at the Mexico City airport back in November, uh, which is maybe less than half from the previous year, but a massive increase. Back in April of last year, there were 4,000. 
Uh, the point being, we have a lot of Americans now, many of them heading to places like Cancun and Los Cabos, traditional you know, hotspots for vacationing. And you know, it's, it's one of these things where on one hand, it brings you know, badly needed income and money, but it also brings disease and, and, and uncertainty. Uh, and so this surge, this growth of, of, of uh, movement has been driven by the fact that in the United States, the lockdown in many places has been so severe that people who have connections in Mexico or opportunities to go are, are using this opportunity to, to do that. Uh, and, you know, I'm speaking here mostly of people who have enough money to have, you know, a comfortable situation. They can, you know, stay at a Airbnb. Uh, and, um, you know, we're seeing a lot more data that's uh, showing that uh, increase in, in, in movement. Um, so quite an interesting challenge. Well, the other thing I wanted to ask you about with respect to AMLO is um, he didn't recognize uh, Joe Biden's election for a while. And he was um, the last foreign leader, quite literally. The, I think maybe, uh, I'm not sure if Kim Jong-un might have been up there with him, but literally of all the major world leaders, he was the very last one, literally until the Electoral College finally certified. This quite, um, quite it's strange because, uh, because the man is, you know, it's, it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that Biden will probably take office. He, you know, that was visible from November 3rd on. And, and so now he's insulting Biden his neighbor who could help him, who could reverse all the, the negative things that Trump did on Mexico. And he's, he's distancing himself from Joe Biden. Was, was there a justification for that or was that just bad policy? Um, probably bad politics uh, and obviously a bad policy, but for many it was seen as AMLO had almost struck a Faustian bargain with Trump. He had made a deal where uh, we will take care of those, you know, the dirty work, sealing that border in the South, you know, handling all these uh, asylum seekers in exchange for don't bother us, you know, stay out of our domestic politics. And in effect, that had been the accommodation they made a little over a year and a half ago. Uh, it was the summer of uh, 2019 when basically Trump pressured Mexico to take on the migration of these caravans or else he threatened to increase tariffs on everything. And so it was the typical, you know, twisting of the arm. Uh, and so many people felt that they had made this deal because in part also, AMLO is not a particularly globally oriented person, not interested in international affairs at all, uh, doesn't really speak English, uh, a change from, you know, traditionally for the last 30 years, most Mexican presidents have, usually they have the requisite, you know, Harvard or Yale degree, but they have a working knowledge of English as global leaders. No, AMLO is definitely a, you know, more, uh, I guess, domestic focus, more, uh, like whatever you want to call it, anti global Isolationist. <laughs> Isolationist, absolutely. Now he would say, and certainly his supporters, that he's worried, you know, he's a Mexico firster. That's his, that's his agenda. Uh, but definitely, uh, I think as we see the transition to Biden now, it's going to get a bit more complicated because the Biden administration is likely to engage Mexico more on many things, on human rights, on environmental protection, on, you know, the plight of these migrants, but, you know, in a different way. Uh, less focus on just the security, more the human, the economic, and that's going to get a little more complicated. And uh, so I think it's it's fair to say that it's not going to be rosy or easy. Uh, now, for many parts of Mexico, I think that's important. Mexico should be held accountable. Corruption should be, you know, spotlighted. Uh, democratic norms should be supported and the like. Uh, of course, today the U.S. faces its own credibility crisis, given you know our own uh, democracy in shambles. But nevertheless, uh, the relationship between Mexico and the U.S. has always been very complex, interdependent, and we're going to go back to that. Under Trump, we had a brief period where they sort of relaxed and kind of each went their own way. Uh, that's changing, yeah, and it's going to be, I think, a, a bumpy road, uh, I would say, along the way. Yeah, really, too, too bad. Um, you know, one thing is, um, I don't know what the percentage of kids separated from their parents uh, by the Trump administration was Mexican kids, or just you know uh, south south of the border into into you know far the far reaches of Latin America. Um, but I wonder if uh, Emlo has ever weighed in on that. You know, we saw, for example, we saw Biden weighing in with Putin a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. saying, you know, you're acting badly. Don't do that again. Now he may not go to war over it. He may, he may not even do sanctions. But at least he made a moral statement. And I wonder if AMLO ever made a statement to Trump about anything Trump was doing uh, to abuse, um, you know, the, the migrants, the people who are coming over the border, and the people who are being badly treated by the 
American immigration system and by separating children from their parents? Uh, a short answer, no. Uh, tr uh, AMLO, almost like Trump, has made a deliberate point of minimizing any, you know, careful not to criticize, say anything that might, you know, rattle. Uh, and so uh, basically Mexico has a very strong doctrine in its foreign policy of non-interference in the affairs of others. You know, we hear it often from China, a version of that, non-interference. But for Mexico, it is a very important part. They do not want, and the, the leaders, for example, don't want to somehow pontificate or give commentary, opinion, analysis of what's happening. That's their business. Stay out of ours and you know we won't comment on yours. But it's just, so no, he has not said anything that would antagonize Trump. He has preferred to just keep mum. Now, yeah, yeah. We, that's the short answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, with the, all of that now, all of what we've talked about, you know, his um, emergence on the political scene, um, his position on you know, public policy issues in Mexico, um, his his uh, failure on dealing with COVID, his, his failure on uh, establishing a good relationship with Joe Biden and all that. How how is he seen by the by the the world outside of Mexico, the world outside of the U.S.? I mean, you know, does he have relations, or is he an isolationist about that too? Um, is he participating in anything? Uh, well, any multilateral, uh, you know, engagements? Uh, no, he doesn't participate. In fact, he makes a point of not going to any of the regular meetings. You know, the G20, the APEC, uh, the you know various others. So he will send his foreign minister. He has not attended a single one. Uh, quite dramatic. Um, I will say, however, Mexico does, in fact, and even with the crisis with with the U.S. and Trump, it has, in some ways, reached out to other uh, Latin Americans, Europe even uh, you know, China and Russia, and even, for example, with the vaccine uh, drama right now, it has reached out to Russia. It has also, I believe, uh, maybe be a place where they're doing some of the testing and even for the Chinese viruses. So it does maintain, and I think as part of its strategy is to some diversify a bit, if you will. But in general, AMLO is not a particularly engaging global you know, player, let's say. So how is he seen? I mean, you know, it depends around the world. I mean, he is a populist leader. So those who may support that will see him as reflecting that. Many who are more skeptical and critical of this will see him as reflecting this anti-liberal uh, trend uh, or illiberal democracies that we see. Um, and he just happens to be from the left, uh, but it's very much a populist formula that erodes some of the democratic norms, let's say. Um, Beyond that, because he has not had much of a present, has not traveled, has not received a lot of world leaders, he doesn't have a real uh, uh, personal relationship that he's developed with many of them at all. Uh, even Latin American leaders, often Mexico is one of the key, you know, it's the largest Spanish speaking and the second largest after Brazil. But interestingly, under AMLO, it has taken a bit of a, a more, uh, uh, I won't say relaxed, but maybe a more low key role, not as a leader of the region uh, on issues like Central America, or the crisis in Venezuela, that's another example. You had South American leaders coming together to address Venezuela more, Mexico trying to stay away and not have to engage. But at the end of the day, you can't. It's a big country. It's a big player. It needs a seat at the table. And unfortunately, right now, it is not. It is not playing that role. Well, that, that leads me to, uh, to one area, one final area I want to talk to you about. And, you mentioned early on that the people um, in Mexico, uh, although his his popularity has has declined in the, in the past uh, two years, um, but he's still he's still okay, and a lot of people support him. That's that's the impression I have. And so, query: um, Is this the best thing for Mexico? I mean, if if you are John Q. Everyman voter uh, and and being fully informed or reasonably well informed. Would you would you support a guy like this? It seems to me that that what Trump has shown us is that our relationship and you and I have talked about this a number of times. Our relationship with Mexico is more important now than it was before, and our recognition, our awareness, our our um, you know uh, our, our our affinity for them as our neighbor to the south, uh, at least with the people I know, has has improved. Um, we are we are more sympathetic. Um, and we want to see them succeed. We want to have a, a good economic relationship, social relationship. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to have that kind of wetback mentality where we just marginalize them and abandon them. 
you know, in the world stage. Um, so Mexico has so many attributes that we ought to relate to. I don't know if Biden feels this way. Um, I, I, I assume as an enlightened person, he does. But query, you know, is, is, is AMLO the right person at the right time? What, what, what kind of profile would you like to see in there uh, to you know, develop Mexico as a player on the world stage, or at least the stage of the Americas? Yeah. Oh, well, that's a, a good question, a tough one. Uh, let me quickly say this. On one hand, Mexico, my take on it, um, because of the social challenges, inequality, and justice, it does need a leader who can address those. I mean, Mexico has been a very, um, I guess, uh, unequal society for a very long time. Um, but having said that, I think what he lacks, unfortunately, is competence or, or maybe reliance on, you know, expertise that can look at the thing in the fuller picture. Uh, instead, like so many places, it is deeply polarized. And so a lot of his agenda is driven more by opposing everything that was done before or blaming everything on what was done before, rather than having a very concrete solution on the table, um, simply continue to say it's all about neoliberalism and it's all about, you know, those past leaders that were corrupt, and now we're no longer corrupt. Well, that's beginning to erode. Um, and while he does continue to have popularity, I, I will say that, it, again, it is among the larger population at large, not all of them particularly well informed or the social media ripe with its own disinformation. Uh, among the intellectual and more educated elites, I mean, he, I mean, there will be some on the far left who certainly support him because the alternative is worse but many others who are just disappointed because uh, while he may say certain things, he doesn't deliver the goods at the end. Uh, he, he, and, uh, you know, he just doesn't come across as being extremely competent at doing things. Instead, it's easy to criticize and critique, as we all know, of almost like with Trump, we saw it, a politician in campaign mode. It's one thing to do that. It's another thing to make the tough decisions. And I just, I'll finish with this quick anecdote. I mean, he, every single morning of his presidency in weekdays, he has a morning press conference for like an hour, hour and a half, and and uh, the morning news, and it's like, literally, it's almost like you know, here we turn on the in the U.S. you turn on the news and you got the local TV station. Well, here in Mexico, you got the president every single morning. Now, since he got infected a few days ago, he's had a substitute, a uh, one of his cabinet officials that does it. But what am I getting at? At some point, it gets a little bit old, and people are tired of it. And you know, once again, uh, so we often hear a lot of cynicism now that the president spends all his time just rambling instead of doing the business of the state, uh, he would argue, and maybe some support as well, he's the most transparent, the most, you know, open, you know, always there. But at the end of the day, you know, you're judged by your results and your outcomes and the policies that you choose. And if you don't have them or you can't deliver them, uh, ultimately all politicians end up losing some of their support. Uh, Mexico has a fixed six-year term, no re-election. And so typical of every administration, you know, they start off, they get going, but by the end, the last year or two, it's always, you know, both how to, what you can rob and steal or what you can get away with or how you can hopefully leave, you know, some kind of legacy, but it's not easy. Um, so he's approaching the middle. Uh, this is now his third year. And interestingly, when he ran for office three years ago now, he promised the population that after three years at the midterm, He's going to have a referendum to judge his uh, state, and if they don't want him, he'll go. Well, we haven't seen details that that's going to happen. Probably not, uh, but uh, you know, people will certainly hold him accountable to that and say, "Hey, here we are at the midterm. What's going on?" So it's a tough dilemma, and, and again, Mexico is suffering from this pandemic. It has suffered more than most places a downturn of the economy, uh, an economy that is already highly informal, and and now even more. Uh, and then the pandemic, it has not been managed well. There's a lot of concern that the government has not done well with the information, eroding confidence, credibility. So it's a recipe for probably more tough times ahead. Um, beyond that, we'll have to see because the engagement we're going to see from the Biden administration is going to challenge him. Ultimately, I think it's, it's important and necessary because uh, the U.S. and Mexico have so much interdependence that uh, it requires it requires that engagement. Uh, and so I'm optimistic that that's gonna be helpful over time. I'm not sure about the status of AMLO. How will he survive or come ahead out of this? Uh, it, right now it looks tough. And the fact that he's been infected as another world leader leaves us all wondering, will he survive it? Or even if he does, will he use it as a chance to 
somehow, you know, come out like a Superman and, and you know, and maybe continue to neglect the pandemic or will he maybe like the Boris Johnson model where he, you know, I'm not saying he was successful, but a little bit more, you know, learning lesson of sorts. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I'm inclined to think probably not. And in talking to a lot of people, reasonably educated people, I'm a surprised at how high a percentage assume that he, he's not probably infected, that he might just be pulling one on us. I don't know. Well, uh, in, inherent in your, in your remarks uh, uh, a little while ago is the notion that things are not, with him, things are not likely to get better. Uh, and as he goes down the remainder of his term, things are likely to get worse. Uh, and and maybe to some extent, you know, the the, the American president has a, a fair amount of influence over the president of Mexico, and I don't know if if Biden takes on some some kind of role there and says, Emlo, let me show you the way, let me give you some suggestions. I don't want to push you around, but you know, here's some suggestions on how we can do better. Uh, that might have a salutary effect. So if Joe Biden were listening today, what advice would you give him about this? Well, I think we're going to see it. And it's basically to engage because Mexico has has such an important role for the U.S. They must. They, we, we must have a conversation. And, and it's always been there at many levels, not just the leaders. The leaders need that. And they do need to reach out and talk to each other. I don't see AMLO being the one, but I do see Biden probably. And we should see in the next month or two, there will possibly, typically there would be some kind of me meeting, a reunion. It hasn't happened. Uh, with Trump, it happened with AMLO visiting Washington July of 2019 to sign the new revised uh, free trade agreement. Uh, they did that uh, actually last year, I'm sorry, last July, the only time they met. Uh, but uh, I think with Biden, yeah, engage him as they will. Uh, and will I, I think it has to be that way because the alternative is not ideal to somehow stay disconnected. So, yeah. It, yeah. Okay, well, we'll have to follow it, won't we? Carlos Suarez, a uh, regular correspondent to uh, dealing in all kinds of international issues. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Aloha and thank you, Jay. Aloha, Carlos.